Is the quarterback battle done? One commander's player certainly seems to think so. That and more on today's episode of Locked On Commanders. Your daily podcast on the Washington Commanders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome into this Friday episode of Locked On Commanders, your daily podcast covering the Washington Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks so much for making Locked On Commanders your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget you can subscribe for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast, and you can continue the conversation over on subtext at joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Commanders where you can go one-on-one with me because I'm your host, David Harrison, dharrison82 on Twitter, credential member of the media and Washington Commanders beat reporter for Commander Country, Sports Illustrated's fan nation site covering the Washington Commanders. Here with you every Monday through Friday, except for when I'm a little bit sick, which I was for two episodes this week, and then I had computer issues Thursday that prevented me from dropping this Friday episode on time. So I apologize for all of the inconvenience. Again, when it rains, it pours, and this week it poured but we are finally getting this thing down so we can get an episode out before the Father's Day weekend. Of course, to all the fathers out there, happy Father's Day to you, to all of you out there. Hope you have a happy and safe weekend. And for those celebrating Juneteenth as well, also have a very safe weekend. Along with our everydayers, I always appreciate all of you for coming through and for your continued support on the show of the show. On today's episode of Locked On Commanders, we're going to discuss some interesting comments made by head coach Ron Rivera, and we're going to talk about some ownership updates. But first, we're going to start with the conclusion of the commander's quarterback battle. That is, of course, according to one player. But before that, I have to tell you that we are brought to you today by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on NFL, and they'll throw in a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti style tumbler with every order. Washington commander's coach Ron Rivera says the team is holding a battle for the starting quarterback job. And that while Sam Howell is starting off as QB1, it's not his job yet. It's just basically his job to lose. Well, commander's receiver, Jahan Dotson, second-year receiver, Jahan Dotson enjoys playing with Sam Howell on the practice field, enjoys his leadership, and went as far as to say on the Jim Rome show recently that he thinks that this battle is actually already done. Let's hear from Jahan. So it's always challenging when you play your first year because you make the adjustment and then you deal with some injuries. And then... By the way, you've got three different quarterbacks that you played with last season. That's not easy either. It looks like Sam Howell might be the guy atop the depth chart right now. Does it feel like that situation will be more settled overall this year? And how has he looked so far in OTAs? Yeah, you know, I think I think we, we got our quarterback situation settled. I think Sam Howell is going to be our guy. You know, I have complete faith in him. Uh, he He's a guy who, who I, always, I always say this, you know, he makes he makes throws look super effortless on the field. Um, he, he's been a great leader. Uh, he's learning how to how to lead an NFL offense. Um, he, he's just learning the ropes just as we are, you know, uh, being in a new offense. So I'm super excited for him. You know, I, I can't wait to get out there and just make plays for him and make his make his life and his job easier as easy as possible. So, you know, I can't wait for it. All right, so that's Commander's wide receiver, Jahan Dotson, basically saying what we've all wanted to say or are saying, but – for for this aspect of it, I think it means a little bit more, right? Coming from a receiver who's inside the room on the field during practices, talking to the coaches, talking to offensive coach Eric Bieniemy, offensive coordinator, and assistant head coach Eric Bieniemy. I think that when a guy like Jahan goes on the record uh, and says in an interview with a media member that he thinks that this this thing is already basically decided, I I like to think that that basically carries a little bit more weight. Now it's not the same as Eric Bieniemy saying it's decided. It's not the same as Coach Ron Rivera saying. Uh, that has been decided, but I do think it's a step up, at least from the talking heads like me on this show, who basically tell you that during the OTAs, during the mini camps, Sam Howell's getting all the first team reps, right? He's he's out there with Terry McLaurin. He's out there uh, with Jahan Dotson going up against, you know, Emmanuel Forbes, Kendall Fuller when he's on the field, you know, Derek Forrest, all those guys in the passing game and not Jacoby Brissett. And Jacoby Brissett is out there with you know, Deami Brown, maybe a little bit of Curtis Samuel, Jahan Dodson mixed in there, but mostly it's your Dax Milnes uh, of the world. And again, in this OTA mini camp portion of, of the offseason program, there is some intermingling, right? Dax Milne might get a rep with Sam Howell because guys are rotating in, resting. You're not going to give one guy all of the reps, right? That's just how they, they do things to kind of mitigate injury risk. Um, but for the most part, like I said, when you identify the first team uh, offense, it's been quarterback Sam Howell out there. On top of that, though, Jahan Dodson's not the only commander's person member right who's been ranting and raving a little bit about what the quarterback has done and has been able to do uh offensive coordinator Brianna and assistant head coach 
Eric Bieniemy has come out several times and talked about how he likes his mentality. He likes how he learns in the meeting rooms and how he likes the autocorrect, right? That was kind of one of the more popular quotes uh, from EB about Sam is how he autocorrects himself on the field. He makes a throw. If there's something wrong with the throw, whether it's decision mechanics, what is it, whatever it is, he goes back and he fix it, fixes it on his own. And I go back to that interception in the right corner of the end zone every day, as we talked about this at the end of the mini camp session, you know, he threw a pass to the right corner of the, of the end zone. It was actually intended for Jahan Dotson. Uh, ironically enough, he left it short. It was intercepted by Troy Apke. Again, Apke in there with the first-team defense, getting some rotational work because they were resting uh, a good amount of their veterans, including Kendall Fuller, and Cam Curl still wasn't uh, on the field during team drills. Well, later on in in the in the 11-on-11 the 11 11 session, we see them come back to that type of route. This time it's Dax Milne running the route. This time Sam Howell throws it, and he throws it in the right spot. He doesn't underthrow it, doesn't leave it short, and it connects for a touchdown. That's the type of auto-correcting that Eric Bieniemy is talking about because they didn't break. Like that was during the same 11 on 11 session, you know, that they, they came back on. So every dares have heard this, but I do believe that this is an underrated factor of Sam Howell. And that is the mental consistency because they mental consistency also shows mental agil agility and toughness. Right. And I go back to the story. I've, I've kind of told this before, like weeks, weeks. I mean, honestly, from rookie camp to week 17 of the NFL season last year, Sam Howell was kind of one kind of was one kind of person. He was the kind of young man that I talked to and got to know a little bit from a professional standpoint. And whether he's a, a rookie, uh, a young quarterback in training camp, a third string quarterback, a second string quarterback, he was the same kind of dude. And then when it was announced that he was going to be the starting quarterback for week 18, you know, I kind of expected not, you know, this like diva by any means, but I did expect just a little bit of a different tempo, uh, a different cadence from Sam, just because you are now the starting quarterback. And there's a, a certain amount of pressure and, and added uh, ability, you know, effect to that whole the scenario, the environment that you're now in. Right. Um, but what we saw, and I told you as this was the same quarterback, you know, talking to Sam week 18 was the same as talking to Sam weeks, you know, training camp through 17. Uh, and I thought that was very impressive. I, mean, I thought that showed kind of a cool, calm mentality of Sam and kind of how he presents himself. So I'm in the locker room after the win. He was the same type of Sam Howe, talking to him during the press conference after the game. Same type of guy. Uh, I even asked him, you know, did nerves ever really kind of come in? Was there a moment where he kind of had to say no, you know, push the nerves away? And he admitted that, yeah, like when he ran onto the field uh, for the final time before the game started, that those nerves kind of started to climb in. He had to kind of just say rely on everything you know. And, you know, I think that shows a little bit of a mental maturity about him that, to be quite honest, is not there with every single quarterback. We've seen quarterbacks come through here. I've seen quarterbacks in other locations as well that don't have that type of mental consistency, that kind of ebb and flow based on what's happening around them. But for Sam, you kind of think of it as a boat, you know, in the water, the waves might be churning, but the boat looks steady. Or you can talk about a duck where he looks smooth on the surface, but, you know, underneath there's a lot of, a lot of turmoil happening. So whatever analogy you want to use, Sam has shown that, right? And then going through this offseason's QB1, showing up at EB's press conference and then talking to him here during the OTAs, during the minicamp. Again, he's the same. He's the exact same persona, exact same mentality, exact same pitch, delivery, and tone that I met at rookie camp last year. And, and, and while that's not going to appear on Madden and it's not going to get you fantasy points, I do think that that is a little bit of an underrated value uh, about how Sam Howell approaches the job. And as far as Jacob Brissett goes, you know, I think he's embracing this number two role. Uh, you know, he's answering the questions kind of the right way, talking about competition. You always want to push each other and all these things. But you also see him and Sam Howell walking off the field after practice quite often, and they're talking. They're talking shop. And, you know, and I think it's great to see a veteran quarterback like Jacoby Brissett, who's not only embracing the role, embracing the young guy, but also conversing and, and talking shop and sharing ideas. That's only going to make Sam Howell more successful. It's only going to make the Washington Commanders more successful. And I don't know if Coach Jacoby Brissett, uh, is in the future there somewhere. This is a really great run up uh, to that for him. So, uh, you know, bottom line up front, quarterback number one this year, quarterback number two this year looks better than quarterback one and two looked this time last year. So even though that's not going to directly translate to wins as far as right now is concerned, uh, if you're a Commanders fan, I would say that there's at least a little bit of excitement uh, or encouragement you could take from that fact. And I think that uh, if you ask people who are witnessing what's happening out there on the practice field, uh, from a media standpoint, who saw everything going on last year, what's happening this year, I think that most would agree with that. So uh, coming up next, we're going to talk about uh, some NFL ownership, uh, Washington Mayor's ownership updates, some some timeline information as far as when the sale might go complete. That is coming up next on today's episode of Locked On Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team 
every day. And today's episode of Locked On Commanders is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Bird Dog shorts do the exact same thing as Lululemon, but they fit way better. They also fit way better than the regular shorts that I've owned for most of my adult life that are stiff, restricting, made of cotton because Bird Dogs invented cloud knit fabric, and that's what their shorts are made out of. They look just like khaki, but they stretch so you get a slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. Bird Dogs also uses anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long. And the best part is Bird Dog stretch khaki shorts are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and the leg, giving you a truly sculpted look. I already owned a pair of Bird Dog joggers beforehand. I got two new pairs of Bird Dog shorts along with my custom tumbler. And I'm telling you right now, I enjoy all four of those items uh, in my house right now as we speak. In fact, I'm getting ready to go out here in a little bit and burn some hot dogs and hamburgers for the family to get the Father's Day festivities going. And I'm going to be wearing a pair of my Bird Dog shorts while I do it. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on NFL to get a free Yeti style tumbler with your order. That's birddogs.com slash locked on NFL for a free Yeti style tumbler. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise. Thanks again for being a Locked On Commander. your first listen or your first view today and every day. Every day as we are getting into the dreaded dead period but we're still going to be dropping episodes uh, as long as i'm not under the weather under the weather and as long as my computer is agreeing with me we will continue to uh to drop episodes as we get through the off season and get ready for training camp continuing today the second biggest topic concerning commanders fans these days is ownership news starting quarterback obviously is a big deal and going to be probably the most important part of whether or not the commanders are successful this year but this ownership news is very important. And this week, CBS Sports reported that NFL owners have been notified by the league uh, for two dates to potentially vote and make the sale of the Washington Commanders from Dan and Tanya Snyder to Josh Harris and his group official. One of those dates is July 20th, so just over a month away. And the other date is August 8th, which is into training camp, uh, but I believe before the first preseason game. I don't think the first preseason game is before that, but I don't have the calendar right in front of me. Um, if improve, if approved, the Josh Harris-led group would then buy the Washington Commanders for $6.05 million. Among the people, of course, in Josh Harris's group are NBA legend and Hall of Fame basketball player Magic Johnson. Now, when this vote happens, whether it's July 20th, August 8th, or maybe even another day, if it comes to that, Harris will need at least 24 votes from the NFL owners to be approved as Washington's new owner. Harris also owns the Philadelphia 76ers in the NBA and the New Jersey Devils of the NHL. So there's that pro sports experience that we've talked about before that makes him an attractive majority owner. Uh, so what does this, this information mean, right? What is the fact that the NFL has kind of notified owners that there's going to be two dates potentially set for a potential vote for this. I think what it means is that that meeting in New York that we talked about recently, uh, every day as you'll remember that went pretty well, right? And uh, to recap, just in case you haven't, you don't remember, or if you happen to miss that episode, um, the meeting in New York was essentially for the NFL and, and a panel of owners to kind of get some updates and some information from Josh Harris to make sure that the criteria requirements to purchase an NFL team were either met or on their way consistently and confidently to being met. And the, one of those stipulations that was talked about was the fact that Josh Harris, as every majority owner in the NFL does, has to own at least 30% of the team. So when you talk about $6.05 billion, at least 30% of that has to come from Josh Harris himself. And only $1.1 billion of that, I just said only $1.1 billion of that, can be uh, debt. So you can't take a loan for any more than $1.1 billion from anybody or anywhere uh, to, to buy that 30% minimum of the team. Now, of course, more than that can be his. I think there, there is a cap, but I'm not sure what that number is for majority ownership. But basically up to 70% of the team can be owned by other minority owners, uh, but the majority owner has to own 30%. So nobody in theory could own more than 29% if Josh Harris only owns 30%. And there have been reports, several reports, we don't have a full list, but that there are around 20 minority owners involved in this Josh Harris group. Of course, those owners also have to be vetted. So you have the situation of Josh Harris having to own X amount of the, the franchise, only being able to do so much of it through debt. And then the other minority owners get reportedly around 20 or so uh, minority owners having to be vetted as well. With everything that's gone on with the Washington Commanders franchise, you don't want to sell this team. Then a week later, find out that one of the 20 minority owners is an embezzler or something and is going to jail for a Ponzi scheme or something crazy, right? So that's why this process is dragging out a little bit. But again, 
if the NFL is, is sending dates to owners for potential meetings, then it means that, you know, either by July 20th or, you know, July 15th or so, then the vetting process is going to be done. The finances are going to be put in line and proof of that is going to be put in line. Or if not, then they'll give them a drop dead date of, say, like August 5th or 6th or so to make sure they get everybody in line. They're not going to want to collect all the owners on July 20th or August 8th and then not have their ducks in a row. So certainly one of those two dates, either way, before the regular season starts, uh, it looks like the Washington Commanders will have a new owner, and this season can officially be the turning of the page from the Dan Snyder era. So what's going to happen once the meeting happens, once the vote happens, once the sale goes through, what's going to happen there? Well, obviously, we're going to have press conferences, right? Uh, I anticipate there's probably going to be a press conference in the location of the meeting, in the location of the vote, probably do all those kinds of things. Um, and then hopefully, I'm hoping at least there's going to be at least a majority owner uh, press conference, Josh Harris press conference in Ashburn or at FedEx Field wherever they decide to do it so that the local media can get their crack out. Of course, certain local media members will probably most likely be at the vote as well, depending on when and where it is. I may be there myself, but if not, I'm sure that, you know, Nikki Javal of the Washington Post, maybe John Kime of ESPN, Ben Standing of The Athletic, you know, kind of the, the usual suspects, right, will probably be on hand uh, to report from it live. And then the rest of us will take uh, what we can from video transcripts stuff like that uh and and, and go from there uh from that point on after press conferences you know meet the media deliver the message deliver the inspiring quotes and all that stuff fan engagement i mean when, when you go back to the espn report of the documents that they got from the josh harris group to try to elicit more uh minority owners right it was all about fan engagement how do we get this franchise reconnected with the fan and fan base so expect a lot of that there's already some moves being put in place uh, not necessarily by the Josh Harris group, but moves that are being put in place that are very good, uh, like the the involvement of adding 2,000 bleacher seats to the training camp uh, practice field area so that fans attending training camp practices will have plenty of room uh, to sit, see, and, and enjoy uh, the day. And I hope that you all take advantage of it because uh, truly you you are, your presence, fans, your presence makes practice much, much better, believe me. Uh, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this year's rookie camp OTAs because there have been more fans in attendance than than, than my experience before. So uh, I hope you guys continue that excitement, continue that build up and, and make training camp a lot of fun for everybody uh, involved. After that, you're talking PR, 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 right? Public relations. That's what this team has had a problem with for years and years, decades. So that's something that's where Josh Harris and this group can really put a stamp on. Uh, this team is PR is pu their public relations. As far as expecting any major moves, and again, we'll get into this more once the news actually happens. I don't think Coach Rivera is getting fired. You know, when the when the ownership changes, I don't think you're going to see coaching changes. I don't think you're going to see them come in and force any massive trades or anything like that right away. We're way too close to the beginning of the season for an ownership group to come in and just start, you know, poking around and pushing blocks where they don't need to be pushed. If there were to be a major move, and I'm not even saying this is something that I think will happen, but I would say if there were to be a major move. Perhaps Josh Harris and this ownership group has their own team president in mind that they want to see come in and run the team, and perhaps they decide to replace Jason Wright. Again, not saying that's going to happen, but what I would say is if there is any type of major shakeup immediately following the ownership, that would probably be what, uh, what it is. So if uh, Coach Rivera and his staff can keep things going in a positive direction, then obviously maybe they can convince Jason Wright, maybe they convince the owners, maybe they convince a new team president if that comes to fruition to keep them around for longer than just this season. Uh, canceling practice is kind of an interesting way to go about that. But Coach Rivera had his comments on that and more, and we'll talk about those comments here coming up next on today's episode of Locked On Commanders. <music> Wrapping up today's episode with a couple of interesting things that Coach Ron Rivera recently said. Uh, and the first one we're going to talk about is actually a comment he made about running back Antonio Gibson saying, quote, that's one of the things that EB is looking for is guys that are going to create those kinds of matchups and are going to be matchup nightmares for the opponent. He, being Gibson, is a guy that we mostly want to continue to work with. And Eric wants to make sure this guy gets as many opportunities right now to show us what he's capable of, because I think that'll be a big part of the game plan. End quote. Now, a couple of things are interesting about this, right? First and foremost is... The discuss the, the discussing of game planning this early in the offseason. And, and Coach Rivera is kind of known as a guy who's a little bit more forthcoming with media uh, than maybe a lot of head coaches are and have been, right? But not usually to this extent. Not usually talking about like, yeah, you know, we would like to see Antonio Gibson become a bigger part of our game plan. Now, 
that information alone doesn't really give, you know, if you're the Dallas Cowboys and you hear Ron Rivera say that, uh, you know, in June, you're not going to sit there and say, oh, man, we got to figure it out. Like, so, you know, I don't want to make it bigger than it necessarily has to be, but it is just a little bit interesting. And I almost kind of wonder, and it almost kind of made me think of, you know, maybe there's a little bit of Kansas City Chiefs bravado coming out here. You know, uh, we go back to the Kansas City Chiefs and their press conference is kind of what they talked about. Like, they don't go as far as to say, you know, hey, we've got this really cool play where we're going to get Kadarius Tony open on the right side against the Eagles defense. And we're going to come right back and do it on the left side with a different player. Like they're, they're not going to go that far. Right. But they're pretty confident when they say like, Hey, we're going to come do some things. We're going to, we're going to make sure this guy gets involved. We're going to make sure this happens. Uh, they're pretty confident about what they do and that they can kind of tell you who their focal players are and, and still get away with making them focal points of their offense. So I kind of wonder if, if that's a little bit of, of that kind of starting to show. Um, and we had a previous question during a mailbag episode where a commanders fan asked who, Maybe the next Jarek McKinnon is, and I and I think this kind of resonates with there. I said Curtis Samuel. I still think maybe Curtis Samuel is that guy, but Antonio Gibson certainly has the skill set. You know, maybe not not as fast twitch as as a Jarek McKinnon, but I think that you could see him kind of fill that type of a role, and it just kind of adds on even more intrigue into what Eric Bieniemy is going to do with this offense, specifically what Eric Bieniemy is going to do with these running backs. Because when you look at Brian Robinson Jr., Antonio Gibson. Jared Patterson, Jonathan Williams, and Chris Rodriguez Jr., there's a good range uh, of running backs there, right? Now, they're, they don't have kind of a J.D. McKissick type and, and a pure Jarek McKinnon type of running back, but they've got some options. And if you add Curtis Samuel in there as another option, there's just a lot of things that Eric Bannon could potentially do with the backfield uh, in this offense. And uh, understanding the fact that he's coached guys like Adrian Peterson, Kareem Hunt, Jamal Charles, like he's had a lot of experiences Isaiah Pacheco with different types of running backs, and he's found ways to really get a lot of them to be very successful. I'm very intrigued, very interested to see what Coach Bianami is going to do with his running back group. So Coach Rivera talking about how EB is trying to get Antonio Gibson as many reps as possible in this phase so that they can start formulating a plan to kind of accentuate that is very, very interesting uh, to me. So something to watch for uh, there as well. And then, of course, Every day, as you know, we were supposed to be out in Ashburn this week on Tuesday, but the team did cancel the practice, so we weren't there. Uh, JP Finley tweeted on Twitter, of course, um, around that time, quote, Commander's quite happy with the spring work and don't want to risk any more injury, end quote. And, and by itself, it seems kind of like a throwaway line, not a whole lot to glean from there. But I think it's an interesting decision to cancel the practice, given the fact that this coaching staff, by and large, is considered to be on the hot seat. Like most people think that Coach Rivera is literally coaching for his job this season. And when you see a coach in that position, it's not uncommon to see them make decisions based on doing everything in their power to make sure that their team is ready, coached, and, and properly trained. And usually that's at the expense of downtime, off time, extra missed reps, things like that. So for Coach Rivera to make this decision, I don't disagree with the decision, and, and I want to make sure I'm clear here. I'm not criticizing the decision. I'm actually praising the decision because it's kind of counterintuitive to what most coaches in his position and where, again, the perception is, you know, 10, 11 wins minimum or a playoff win minimum, or you might be fired. You know what I mean? A lot of times those coaches, they kind of, they get more practicey, right? Like let's prepare, 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 uh, and go overboard. And, you know, uh, I think that this is a better way of doing it. I think it's uh, an interesting way of doing it, but for two reasons, I like it. One reason is because I think this does speak well of Sam Howell. I think that if, there were legit concerns about Sam Howell as the quarterback number one. You know, this isn't going to be a situation where they just say, okay, well, let's just easily flip the switch. Jacoby, you're now QB1. Sam, you had your chance. Go sit down. No, I think this is going to be a situation where it's like, okay, if it's not going to go well, let's see how we can fix it. Let's try to fix this thing before we just pull the plug uh, and go to Jacoby. So the fact that the coaching staff, Eric Bieniemy specifically, Ron Rivera as well, uh, feel comfortable enough to give them that day off. And it's only one day, right? But they give them that day off. Uh, for practice, they still did some meetings, classroom stuff, workouts. Uh, but to give them that practice off, I think does it's it's not huge, right? It's not it's not. Like I'm gonna tell you, Sam Howell should be your first round quarterback of fantasy. But I do think it is a symbol of confidence in Sam Howell. And then it got me kind of thinking, this might be a little bit of a secret edge, right? Because really, as you look at the week that we just went through, teams are wrapping up their mini camps Thursday, right? They're having practice Thursday afternoon, Thursday evening. And the Washington Commanders, their last practice was a week ago. So essentially what the Commanders just did from a physical practice standpoint is they built in a bye week for themselves in a program 
but they only missed one practice because they they had already lost two due to the the over over uh, aggression of of last year's training camp or uh, OTA. So it's it's really interesting because if we come to training camp and this team is boom reignited, high energy, looking loose, playing fast, then I think we can look back at this and say, man, like that extra week of rest really helped these guys. And but if they come in slow, then you know I'm worried that somebody's going to say, well, that extra week of rest, you know, wasn't good for them. And it's 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 an interesting dynamic, right? But I think really at the end of the day, like it's one thing to learn things in real time, sit in the classroom, sit in a meeting, go over film, go into practice, put it into, into action. But when you get a chance to step away, when you get a chance to kind of walk away from the game for for a month or so and kind of think about the lessons that you learned, think about some of the things the coaches said to you, you know, whether you're laying on a beach while you're doing it or you're you're chilling in your parents' house or golfing, you know, on the back nine on a on a world famous course or whatever it is you're doing during your downtime. You know, these guys, they live and breathe football, right? So it's not that they're practicing all the time, but believe me, it's 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 going to be one of those things. It's your profession. So if you're laying on a beach, your mind is just going to kind of naturally wander back to those things. And you might see some of these these buttons click, these light bulbs go off maybe a little faster. And again, it, it could be nothing. It could be a little bit of something, but just something interesting that I thought came out of it. And and I like that uh, Coach Rivera and his staff are feeling confident because they, they look good on the practice field. I think this team on both sides of the ball Certainly looks better at this point during this this season than it did at the same point uh, last season for what that's worth. But training camp is going to tell a lot of that stuff. Uh, a fresher team in training camp could perhaps accelerate that learning curve is basically my point. So uh, coming up next week, we're going to be back every day. Every day, I need your questions uh, for our Tuesday mailbag. Once again, uh, it's not going to be live again. I do have some schedule conflicts, so we will have to pre-record that mailbag. But mailbags are always good. We've got some questions already. But I would definitely want to collect more. If we don't get to them on this mailbag, we will certainly get to them on a future mailbag. In the meantime, if you've got other questions or comments, just throw them in the YouTube comments on Twitter. Email me at lockedoncommanders at gmail.com or send them directly to me via subtext. And don't forget, you can continue to talk commanders with me one on one by just heading over to joinsubtext.com slash locked on commanders and get that started today. As always, I want to thank you so much for making locked on commanders your first listen of the day every day. Every day, thank you for coming through on a consistent basis like you do. Thank you so much for making me part of your day, part of your routine. If you have anything else Washington Commanders related, you want to know or you want to discuss, make sure you're also following me there uh, on Twitter at dharrison82. Till we speak again, be safe, be kind, and I'll see you next time for another episode of Locked On Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. <laughs>